Welcome back, everyone, to the SuperCloud 7 event. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in the Palo Alto studios. Got a great lineup all day. Of course, we're focusing on the future of the data platforms, how data is evolving, and certainly as generative AI needs to be taken advantage of all that great data, a modern data platform is evolving from compute, network, and storage is all changing, but the data is the story, and that's where here we have Ina Tokarasella, who's the CEO and founder of Lumex at .ai, who is actually at the CDOIQ symposium right now, uh, dialing in at, here at MIT, Dave Vellante is there with theCUBE. Uh, Ina, great to have you on SuperCloud. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's, this is a big focus on data, the SuperCloud, and obviously, you know, semantic layer, semantic fabric, a term you're coining. Let's get into the topics, but I would like, first of you could take a minute to explain what your company does so we can set some context. You guys are a startup, recently got some financing. What does your company do? Why do you exist? What's the mission? What's the company? Well, that's a great question, and uh, this is my startup, so I like to talk about it as a baby, and uh, this baby is growing, and our mission is to bring application-free future to enterprise. And we're already enabling companies in highly regulated and data-intensive industries, such as pharma, financial services, and retail, to, to basically understand the business data language, uh, which is inherently connected to the data, and being able to incorporate the corporate data and external data, such as industry cloud, synthetic, and APIs, and interact with them in one unified manner. Enterprise AI is going to be the hottest sector. We're predicting it. Obviously, analytics has been around around decision making, business intelligence, predictive analytics, all been there, done that. But generative AI seems to be different. It seems to be that it's evolving at many levels as supercomputing capability comes in and gets democratized. The infrastructure has a lot more capabilities, the role of the data, and then now the applications are changing. What is the big change that you see in this market from a generative AI perspective that's changing it from the classic business intelligence, decision-making, you know, analytics, data science, which by the way is still relevant, but this Gen AI seems to be disrupting it, disrupting and enabling more value in the enterprise. What's the difference between Gen AI and what we've seen before? Well, great question. And uh, the difference to me is the biggest one in the simplest words is instead of bringing data to your analytics, you're actually bringing analytics to your data. And this has to, to come out with the term which you we use a lot agentic AI, and agentic AI is uh, what it means to enterprise as uh, the, the most democratized level of data and analytics access to decision makers. And of course, intelligent business uh, decision making is <laughs> has been around for 20 years as a term, but I do not believe that we enable it to to wide extent. And Gartner says only 20% of decisions in enterprise are made based on data analytics. And someone who has been employed by the biggest enterprises and intelligence companies in the world, it's, I must say, it feels true. Ina, can you explain the difference between why so, yeah. knowledge graphs yeah. are important and what a neural network is and how that relates differently to what a knowledge graph is? So everyone talks about neural networks, but then knowledge graphs also are being discussed. Obviously, this is, this, these are two rich data sets for business context. Can you explain the difference between knowledge graphs and a neural network and, what it, and, and the distinction between them? <laughs> Well, neural networks, of course, it's a, it's a discipline which, um, which mimics how human brain works in automated manner. So we feed it in with lots of data and it applies, let's say, brute force to, to come up with results. And it has lots of examples. So for example, uh, photos labeled with dogs and, and cats and elephants, and, and then it learns, uh, similar to child. But think about data. Right, so we can fill in with lots of data and gives you uh, results which are like approximate um, uh, approximation of what data means, right? But this is not enough. You need context, right? Because, uh, for example, customer relates to product, relates to branch, relates to SKU. Um, uh, as human beings, we, we do think in relational terms, and this is exactly what graph brings brings context. So let's say when we speak about semantic models like GPT, Llama Hugging Face and others, they work by proximity search, right? So when a business person, a business decision maker, they ask a question, they use totally different terminology that is actually 
uh, what is uh, data named like, the labeling of the actual data in the databases. So we have to have this connection, contextual connection, to understand the question in the user context and the company context, even in the Stilingo context, to be able to connect the question to the right data and produce the right results. So you guys have a data fabric and you have a term that you've coined or you use called generative semantic fabric. Um, we've covered semantic layers in the past. So what does the generative semantic fabric mean? Yeah, uh, well, first, uh, generative semantic fabric is a term which you coined and uh, we just call it GSEF, you know, friendly. By the name uh, GSEF is this layer uh, which incorporates content and context. So it's a knowledge graph of semantic embeddings uh, which sits uh, between data and applications. And those applications also mean agents or humans interacting with the data. And what allows you is actually to encapsulate your business data language, your business logic in organization, but also a data state. Right, so it's understand like kind of two sides of the table, and it allows to business users to interact in free language, not in data language, with the, any of the data connected to it, and it's translated to the right assets uh, with high degree of governance and explainability. So this is why I was getting at before the knowledge graph versus the neural network. If you have a knowledge graph of embeddings, isn't that a knowledge yeah. graph of neural connections or? Is that another layer of abstraction? Can you explain that nuance or did I get that wrong? Well, you got it exactly right. So you might heard about semantic embeddings, mm -hmm. which are basically transformers, which, uh, which comprise a, um, a semantic models like LLMs. And there are vector databases. So vector databases are basically a, a, an aggregation of, of vectors of transformers. And uh, lately we see more and more ARAC techniques. So basically combining a uh, graph modeling with, uh, with semantic embeddings to, to provide a higher degree of, of training. But there are some shortcomings. So shortcomings is basically you need to have, to have skills skills to program graphs and program semantic models. And you also have to, to move your data to graph store. I do not see lots of enterprises moving their data around. They already did it with Hadoop once, and then they did it with data lakes. I don't see them yeah. playing in the sandbox one more time just to, you know, just for generative AI. They might be in the future, but not at the moment. They're not shifting their data once again, just, to, just for agents. So uh, think about generative semantic fabric like a new generation, which combines uh, graphs, right? graphs uh, with neural nets, uh, the new generation of graphs and it combines uh, semantic embeddings right so it's graph of semantic embeddings and it also uh, has connection to organizational metadata metadata is to, to your point form of point uh, provides the standard for how relational data is stored so it's able to connect questions to the right assets i love this market because especially with agentic or agents as you mentioned the gen ai next level app and there'll be better ones it's, it's like a database of a database of a database. I got a database that just talks about that database. So, you know, it, this, this, is a, this is now becoming a lot of moving parts. So I have to ask you, with the semantic embeddings and the knowledge graph and having that semantic capability, what problem does that solve? Is it, is it speed for retrieval? Is it more intelligent mapping? Is it more quality on the governance side. What is the purpose of having the semantic embeddings in the knowledge graph versus just say straight queries? So what's the problem that you're solving? I guess that's the question I'm getting to because it makes sense if there's a problem to be solved. Yes, of course. Uh, there is no right for technology to exist unless it solves a problem, yeah. business problem. So yeah, uh, the two problems, big problems which we solve and which uh, basically exist in continuum as the following. AI ready data, being able to map all the data and distill it to business language, basically map it to semantic uh, language. So this is for starters. And the second part is connecting it to the user input, right? So uh, this translator, which uh, comprehends a uh, human impact in free language and maps it to, to this uh, knowledge graph of semantic embeddings, right? So uh, in simple words, AI ready data and access to the data with the uh, agentic AI. Talk about this, the problems that most companies have around silos. Obviously, Gen AI is becoming a silo buster. 
as we call it. it it's uh, um, it's really a forcing. Amplifier. It's forcing <laughs> a lot of change, and the old conversations around platform engineering, you know, data layers, really are not. I mean, that's a blocker that should not be there. So companies are saying, why isn't that fixed? We got to get to the Gen AI piece. So you're seeing a lot of people that have held on to those data silos, uh, data warehouses, or even data clouds being eliminated. They, there's a forcing function here. How does a company do that effectively? Wow, uh, that is so true. And we see more and more companies uh, giving up aggregations and going into federate model just to the fact that Generative AI amplifies any deviations from single source of truth, right? So you do not want to have the uh, answers which, which are randomly selected from, from 10 different definitions for a lifetime value of the customer. Right, so we, we have to have single source of truth and the, the silos of course prevent us from doing so. And this is why a generative AI is the ultimate use case to, to break silos and finally have unified a semantics across organization and even unified semantic across the whole data state. So again, if you use um, um, external data, APIs and so on, so forth, you will be able to, to speak in the same language to, to all of those data sources. And uh, corporations so far uh, didn't really invest in this unification due to the fact that you didn't have the killer use case. If you have guide rails by data engineering and analytics teams, which build your dashboards and curate them with high touch, you don't really have to, to unify and automate uh, all the semantics across organization. Now it's a killer use case it has arrived and, and also appetite has grown. Mm -hmm. So we have more and more update for analytics and data access and democratization within enterprise, uh, but almost no tools to automate that. The killer app is Gen AI, which the killer app of Gen AI is freedom, speed, more time to do things. Uh, so I, I get that, and I want to ask you one follow-up question to that because I like this unification because I do agree, single source of truth, there's a lot of value in there, certainly when you have neural networks and uh, semantic embeddings and knowledge graphs and other techniques to you know, accelerate value out of the data quickly in a generative runtime. The question then is, okay, I can have distributed data that's unified, which is a use case we're seeing because there's never going to be one centralized place. There's going to be centralization of value opportunity but it's going to be distributed. So you have this distributed data modeling unified. So there's a lot of mapping and governance. So what's your vision on how to deploy effectively yeah. a unified semantic or data layer, but it's all over the place. So it's not siloed per se in a monolithic way or from another data source, it's, but it's distributed geographically potentially or by application, but yet have to work together. So what is your, answer to that one. That's a th this is what people are wrestling with. They're, they're struggling or trying to architect that ideal solution. Well, luckily for, for the universe, we've actually built it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and generative semantic fabric in essence, exactly this glue, which connects to the metadata of all organizational structured data sources and business applications, think about CRM systems, CRP systems, support and transactions and operations and so on and so forth. And uh, we automatically build it in, in a coherent terminology, right? The business glossary, metric store, lineage and all of that. Uh, and of course, we, we also wrap it up with augmented governance process. And what it means essentially is we're picking up all different definitions from those silos those different uh, functional uh, silos and maybe geographical silos. And we group them up and, mm -hmm. uh, and provide all the usage information. So for example, your users in customer success use this definition where in sales they have different definition and this is the industry benchmark. So we provide all this information, the workflow when it takes less than 10% of the time for um, data governance personnel to, to actually reconcile the definitions. We see more and more use cases when companies are um, actually automating this reconciliation with Emacs, uh, even without a uh, human involved to less sensitive information, let's say, and for most sensitive workflows that actually have a human in the loop. Yeah. And it gives you ability to, to have centralized, federated uh, layer of definitions of business definitions, metrics, uh, terminology, which are rooted in different data sources whenever they come from. And using metadata allows us to do it on the fly, uh, basically immediately. 
Yeah, it's interesting. A lot more intelligence can come out of that and, and automation building together. You know, I want to get your thoughts on a couple things before I, I get into some of the company things you're doing and, and the story behind the founding of, of your, your venture. Um, because, you know, right now the world is connected. I'd say estimated around 85% of traffic is connected through APIs. APIs obviously drive all the value on interactions between data sources and applications and, and data. And now with the language models and the foundation models, you're starting to see a power law, and we published this over a year ago, it turned out to be true from our research team. And you know, when Dave and I put that together, um, we saw that power law that you can have specialty models and then the large ones, the proprietary, what do you want to call them? Frontier models or whatever they're called these days. But you know, the big ones and little ones. So we're starting to see um, I think we called, coined the term small language model over a year ago, but now Databricks is using that. Ali Godsey had it at, at Databricks Summit. Interaction between models is, is where we're seeing developers looking at how to merge data. So if I'm a developer, I might want to have my own specialty small or domain specific model, but I want to interact with another one and kind of almost pass parameters or prompts or have a programmable experience where the net of it, one plus one is five, result. And the merging and fusion of data seems to be what developers are going to be doing. And we're starting to yeah. see early stages because some people do better things than others. So do you believe that to be true, that that's going to happen? And will APIs be the connective tissue? And then what happens next? It, like as they start fusing together, it's alchemy meets programming, right? I mean, what's your vision? What's your reaction to that? Well, uh, let me agree and disagree because it's a complicated question that you're asking. It's, yeah, a different use cases. So API first uh, is a feature uh, to me, and this is what we see in the market right now. And uh, having orchestration layer, which can uh, reroute different requests to different kind of runtime LLM models uh, are totally required. And this is also one of the offerings of Illumix, of course. And uh, because we see this as the future. On the other hand, I do not see uh, so much a uh, rug and fine tuning techniques involved in the future by the companies due to the shortcomings and the and, uh, uh, low reliability of those techniques on scale. Uh, what we actually provide as an alternative is to, to have this uh, Uber data model replaced with generative semantic fabric, which is by itself fed in as a context to small models or big models. Mm -hmm. Due to the fact that generative semantic fabric is created by uh, semantic models and graph models, which are trained on business ontologies, Right, so it's already industry specific, it's already industry specific context, and this context is fed automatically to, to whatever runtime is coming. So it's API first, but I do not see uh, so many uh, context engineers in the future. So you're saying, if I get this right, then it already has context, it already is trained, <laughs> it's the company data, it is yeah. already good. So it doesn't need yeah. fine tuning, it has context. Uh, so all yeah. you're doing is providing a context pointer to Good data, it's tuned. In, in addition, uh, I think the biggest flaw so far in data management in big organizations is actually that technical people are managing data. <laughs> it's because we have the data to, to enable business in the first place, yeah. but there is a huge disconnect between yeah. business and data. And what we need more are yeah. business people helping to to maybe govern uh, and certify and and be involved more in the semantics but it doesn't have to be on the technical level it should be enabled via application interface there's definitely some uh, great technical you know problems to solve so i can see why engineers love this area at the same time the data has to be accurate and the the generative process means things are being generated a result Something's going on that has to be accurate. You can't have, oops, uh, we got it wrong um, on mission critical activities, certainly on business. I see that, true. Um, Ina, it's great to have you on. And again, I love this conversation. Let's talk about your company. What was the idea? Talk about how the formation happened. What was the motivation? Tell us about the origination story. Well, a uh... Yeah, so I'm graph junkie, you can say, you can tell, right, <laughs> by, by this conversation going so far. 
I'm in graphs for almost 25 years, and now I actually <laughs> revealed my age. And uh, what's happening in the graph area is we used to we used to embed all the logic manually, right? So it's kind of building your association models, and you know it's a highly technical task. What's happening today is we have infrastructure which allows us to capture yeah. all those association and mind maps <laughs> of our business, of our organization, which is super cool to me, yeah. right? And now when we couple it with conversational capabilities and semantics, it opens up this babel fish of of free conversation with whatever assets. And as we started this conversation is our mission to enable application free future, where as an employee in an in organization, you might want to, trip, uh, to plan your trip, or you might have a, to, to complete a procurement workflow, whatever it is, you just, you know, you just um, articulate it to the void, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and this launcher picks up uh, the task or the question and it navigates to the right data, to the right application or the uh, aggregation of those. And to this will happen, uh, we actually require a business logic language, right, which is shared between organizations. We have to have open standards. We have to have API first uh, data stacks. So lots of things have to happen. Yeah. But I must say, in the last two years, we accelerated so much in this direction, it feels like more than in the last 20 years. Yeah. You know, it's funny, 18 years ago, I met Emil when he was in Palo Alto looking for <laughs> venture capital for Neo4j. And um, I was just coming off a podcasting venture before I started SiliconANGLE. And, um, you know, Facebook platform just launched in 2007. Okay, so the graph vision was already just starting. and. Back then, no one was talking about graph databases, but now you fast forward, graphs represent the autonomous for what is the neural network. It is how you can maximize traversal, retrieval, understand and program. Nodes and arcs are very much well understood data structures. So it's hot to be a graph database person right now, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's hard and easy. You don't need to program it in MATLAB anymore. But you need to, to, to focus more uh, on the algorithmic side because what's happening, as you rightfully mentioned, uh, graphs uh, capture your concepts and they also capture the uh, relationship between concepts. But what makes it special for, for every company is they have own business context concepts mm -hmm. which are not captured in general purpose algorithms. So this is where it's uh, it's really differentiator to to implement those in graphs, kind of customize those twenty percent which are left and, and use the generic part and uh, get an advantage of that. And also it's the fastest way to retrieve information if you think about uh, yeah. alternatives of different yeah. stores. Algorithms and graphs go great together. Uh, it's like good wine and food together. So I got to ask you about the company. How long have you guys been around? Um, I, we covered your financing on SiliconANGLE. Put a plug in for your company, what you guys are doing right now, how much you've raised, are you looking to hire, if what positions? And if people are watching and they want to be a potential customer, what's the pitch? What's the pitch? Uh, so let's start with the pitch. Uh, Ilmax uh, provides uh, the ultimate solution to get your data AI ready and enable frictionless analytic, um, agentic analytics. And we're around three and a half years around uh, and give or take and 30 people on the payroll and even more is we are focusing on North America, Europe, uh, Middle East in the moment. Uh, we are financial venture backed, but also corporate venture backed. And recently we also started our expansion to East Asia. So we are growing, we're hiring, especially on go to market positions and uh, Let's let's start our journey together. Yeah, it's global. Congratulations. Final question yeah. for the folks watching SuperCloud 7, they're really interested in the future. And you guys are really on the front range of this big wave that's coming and it's a real infrastructure shift. It's a real software opportunity. It's a great way to leverage the agentic which will scale into applications natively with AI, generative AI. What's the future going to look like? Why, how should companies and, and engineers and architects and business people think about the future of data? As they look at their data estate today, what's the vision of the future? What should they prepare for? They should prepare to, to the future of distributed data. They should prepare to the future of a higher infrastructure costs. 
but lower cost of any uh, runtime. So any semantic model or graph model that we know at the moment today as a service is going to cost less. Uh, they're going to be less differentiated on performance, uh, but it's going to be super expensive to run them. So for you to be able to encapsulate uh, all the value in your uh, dispersed data uh, over this highly cost infrastructure, you have to, to enable as much automation as possible about how you're orchestrating that and how you use as much as, as possible open standards and incorporating technologies which are interchangeable. Ina, thank you for coming on our super cloud and great to have you dial in from Cambridge, Massachusetts at the CDO IQ Symposium where Dave Vellante and theCUBE are filming right there live now and uh, congratulations on your success. We'll be keeping in touch. Love your vision, love this direction. This modern data platforms are here and it's rethinking everything. It's going to flip the script on the future of how data is used, but ultimately the game is going to be the killer app, generative AI and the data fabrics behind it. Ina, thank you so much and, and thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, John. Okay. Bye -bye. I'm John Furrier here with theCUBE. SuperCloud 7, we'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>